I think we're, we're delighted to be here today um, to talk about the Gold Bar Integrity Ecosystem. I mentioned it's a major work stream for LBMA. Um, and the big news is that we have joined forces with the World Gold Council um, to have an entire value chain approach to it. I'm going to let David talk a bit about the, um, the overall project and what it's trying to achieve, the concerns, as well as the future ecosystem. And I think with that, David, if I can hand it over to you. Of course, thanks, Ruth. Um, so, yes, thank you again for uh, having me on remotely. I do regret uh, not being there today. I was very much looking forward to it. But nonetheless, uh, we can still achieve the same, the same goals. So just to, I'm going to run through two or three slides and then I'll hand over to Ruth. So essentially this first slide, 48% of potential gold customers cite lack of trust as a barrier to investment. 28% are worried about buying fake gold. 21% are worried about the alleged purity of the product they might buy. 14% don't even trust the businesses who sell gold. I'm sure you will agree that it's not unreasonable for consumers and investors to demand assurance that the gold that they either invest in or buy is pure, authentic, and both responsibly and sustainably sourced. And I'm sure you will also agree that it's not unreasonable for regulators and the army of nervous institutional compliance professionals across the financial markets to demand a positive assurance regarding the park gold place in money laundering, fraud and illicit trade. And quite clearly, this situation needs to improve. If you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. And so the LBMA and the World Gold Council, if you just heard, have come together to develop a global system of gold bar integrity, provenance and chain of custody. Leveraging innovative distributed ledger technologies, we will create a transparent database of gold bars that will finally align the global gold market with financial best practice and give consumers, investors and traders greater confidence in gold as an asset class. Technology is now sufficiently advanced that the physical gold product can now be linked to a digital twin, ensuring immutable documentation, a digital passport, if you like, which will continuously update in real time as the product moves from mine to refiner and circulates in the market. The passport would contain all the relevant standards, a record of each bar's purity, ethical sourcing, ESG footprints, and align it with anti-financial crime and AML provisions. With this interoperable global ledger of immutable data working seamlessly with spectacular advances in bar security technology, the gold market is very well placed to vastly improve the statistics I mentioned earlier. Uh, the managers, gatekeepers, custodians and service providers will ensure proper oversight, compliance and monitoring of gold throughout the gold bar life cycle, so ensuring ecosystem integrity. And why? Trust and transparency are everything to the gold industry. Equally true, if you're a small retail buyer from a shop in India or a powerful New York asset manager seeking returns on vast pools of capital, this global integrity and provenance database will become the golden source of verifiable data to all encouraging greater market participation and giving consumers, investors and policymakers the world over the confidence to regard gold as a fully mainstream asset. If you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide, please. And so to the future, we are creating a means of verifying the absolute integrity of gold. Your gold is what you want and believe it to be. We're creating a means of verifying the provenance of your gold and to what standards it was mined and refined. Creating a means of verifying your gold's chain of custody, an immutable record of the circulation of your asset. We're creating an ecosystem that has integrity at its very core with vetted participants. Creating a database that uses DLT technology that is both interoperable, scalable, transparent, tamper-proof and immutable. And finally, we are creating a truly global system, one that has already met 
with a principal approval from all key gold market stakeholders. And for that support, both myself and Ruth are very, very grateful. This is the gold market's chance to enhance both its reputation and relevance to existing and future generations. The technology to demonstrate provenance and integrity is now with us, and we must act fast, but crucially act as one. The Bullion Integrity Database will be the solid foundation onto which other technological advances, such as gold tokenization, which is such a phenomenal opportunity for our industry, can build. Thank you, and I'll hand over to Ruth. Thank you, David. So I think David does a good job of setting forth the, the why are we doing this, the, the vision in terms of the future state. And I'm going to talk a little bit more practically as to how do we get from here to there. Um, so in terms of the three risks we're trying to address is where is the gold coming from? Um, who's traded it? Is, it? is it real? Can we trust it? And has it been sourced responsibly? I think about it, it's all about gathering data and making that data transparent. And that's where the blockchain comes in. The other aspect beyond the blockchain database is security features. And this is partly addressing issues of fraud that have plagued the market, particularly on the Kilo bar and the retail side of things. Um, and that's why when we get to the, the pilot, we are talking in phases of starting with Kilo bars as that has the biggest risk and hopefully biggest reward. So in terms of the three aspects, you have the security feature, which is a bit like the identity of the bar, um, the where it's coming from, and really that from the moment it's dug out of the ground, through transport, through the refinery, until it becomes the physical product. And within that life cycle, you've got the data on provenance uh, and country of origin. We've done a lot of work as LBMA in terms of not just the overall ecosystem, but on specifically the security features. And those will be launched when we move to a live situation with the database. So in terms of next steps for the database, we are having a pilot phase, which there's two technology providers, Axidras and Peer Ledger. If you haven't met them, I know that the, both companies are here and would welcome conversations. Um, thank you to our sponsors as well. But really the point of the pilot is to test the vendor systems, make sure it's delivering on the promises we're trying to achieve. Are we creating efficiency? How is the onboarding process, especially for the people who have to deal with these systems on an ongoing basis? Is it really going to deliver the data that investors need in the downstream to meet its ESG requirements? And how painful is that going to be? How can we make this efficient? But I think for us as an industry, the other aspect is what are the mandatory fields? And that's something, say, Belinda talked about as well when it comes to ESG, is we as an industry have to say, what, what must we know in order to have confidence and trust? And what is nice to have? And very important in that is making sure that the client is also protected and that you're seeing what you need to see as a member of that value chain. Certainly there's a role for LBMA in how we review our good delivery refiners. It's taking the data that we monitor at the moment on an annual audit basis and really giving granularity to the types of materials that are going through in the journeys. Um, so there's a lot of work still to be done, um, but we are delighted to have had so many members of the value chain taking part. Um, from a refining perspective, it's representing 41% of annual refined production um, in terms of the refiners just taking part in the pilot. So I really wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's put their hand up for the pilot. I think it's a meaningful statement in terms of the value chain standing up and moving forward in this initiative, um, as well as a big thank you to the providers, um, and all of those of you who've been involved in the multiple working groups and committees where we have discussed, and I know we will continue to discuss, to make sure that it delivers on the promises. Um, David, I, I think it's to you, leave over to you to say thank you as well in terms of yeah, the- it, Thank you, Ruth. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody who's taking part in the pilots and people beyond that. There's been a lot of work that we, as Ruth has said, there's going to be a lot more. Um, but uh, every little contribution we have at this stage will set this market uh, on, a, on a very solid platform to move forward. Uh, we have a great opportunity. The technology is with us now. 
And thank you. We'll try and make it as uh, unonerous or de-onerous as we possibly can moving forward. But I think we're setting ourselves on, on very firm ground for new technologies as they appear. So from me personally, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think that really leaves us to open it up for questions. Um, I don't have a device in front of me if there's been questions coming through, um, but I can sure I can get one. But if there's anyone who wants to raise their hand and ask a question from the floor, yeah. I think it's a better question for you, Sakila, <laughs> in terms of the timelines of the private. Um, I think we do have microphones, though. Yeah? <laughs> nice try. I'd give you mine, but it would be involved. I mean, it's sing along, so that would help. Yeah, well. Sure. Um, so the question was, uh, what are the timelines of the pilot um, as soon as possible? So we're looking at April to get going, and then we're going to run it for approximately three months, uh, plus or minus, going to see what other challenges, what issues are we identifying. We're going through all the paperwork as we speak at the moment, um, and, you know, the lawyers amongst us do like to slow things down a little bit, so we're going to hasten that and then get going with the actual practical implementation. And as you saw, understanding the data, the connectivity, the, uh, the governance, the policies, the processes. Really, this is an opportunity to really get into the detail of does this technology actually make sense for the gold market? So if anybody else wants to take part, by the way, that's not the finite list. If you do want to, we can make an exception. Um, but I would encourage you to speak now because once we get going, it might become a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And, and for those of you who don't know Sakila, um, she is general counsel as well as executive board director for LBMA, um, and she's leading on the GBI initiative for us. But there is another question from the floor, which I'm excited about because it's more dynamic than asking. So please, if you could identify yourself. Sure. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm Tarsin Chowdhury from an audit firm called Tuf Nord, uh, based in Germany. So we're one of the auditors for the LDMA. And the question really is, it's fantastic that you're using blockchain, but does this mean that us auditors are going to be made redundant? <laughs> I think it's actually the opposite. I, I think from our side of things, you'll be very familiar with um, at the end of the audit process, there's also the confidential annex in terms of country of origin material. But what it should mean in terms of your interrogation of that information, one, it should be a lot more transparent. Um, but I think the question we need to address as well as, as LBMA is, is waiting for, you know, to, to three months after close of financial year end soon enough. Um, and so I think it's a discussion for assurance providers in terms of how do we deliver on promise and what can we and, get, and what should we do, what can we do, um, and really would look forward to that dialogue. So definitely not making you redundant. Don't worry about that. Um, any other questions from the floor? Oh, Mark Hanna, I believe over there with the orange tie. Thanks, Josh. So I've been playing around with this for a while. So my question is coming from... Uh, a mixed experience. Uh, the question really is interoperability downstream and the integrity of the movement all the way through the supply chain, eventually towards the consumer. Uh, that turned out to be a gigantic stumbling block uh, for our program. So I'm sure you guys fixed it, but. I think the point on interoperability is crucial. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I, I focus on the the agreement on fields is so important, because if we can agree on a common language, then getting those systems to speak to, get to each other is much easier. But at the moment, there's, there's just not enough clarity. But I would really welcome some more feedback from you, Mark, in terms of I know hmm. you guys have really been down this path. Yeah, very happy to share all the experiences from a small supplier to large supplier to hmm. manufacturer to retailer. It's been quite an interesting uh, conversation. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Oh, there's questions on the thing. Hold on. So what feedback have we gotten from the clearers? What participants are you looking for in the pilot? So the, the physical committee has been part of all of our discussions. Um, and certainly, we are starting with kilobars, as I mentioned, which at the moment are not deliverable in London, um, really because that's the biggest risk, but also biggest reward. So certainly they have been involved and here to date and watching with interest. Um, but I think I can't really speak for them. It's for you to speak to them. In terms of, is there an update on certification of security features versus the standard? 
you probably didn't see on my slide that I said we've identified six to date and we look to launch these with the database. Partly is if we launch too soon, it could create quite a lot of market confusion. I think getting it streamlined, particularly for those carriers and vaults who will be on the sharp end of having to process subsistence material is really important. So I think the panel, and I'm very grateful to everyone who sits on that panel, have done excellent work in going through what have been some fantastic features, some less inspiring, but on the whole, very good work. Um, so I think that's in a good place. It's just we don't want to get um, the cart before the horse. How do other... So I think in terms of other service providers getting involved, in terms of the pilot, um, we're looking at the two, partly because I think that's what the industry can handle right now. Um, but the point is it's meant to be an ecosystem. Um, and it has to be interoperable if it's going to succeed. So there's certainly opportunities. Because part of, um, you know, David had said as well that we've, we've gone around to major centers and talked about this industry, like this ecosystem. Many people already have their own systems in place, some of which are run by governments. We're not going to expect those to be replaced by this database, but we would like them to be able to speak to each other. And I think that's the crucial, how we determine that, um, that global language and making sure that that language translates to something that for you guys on the jewelry side or in the investor side means something to the people buying it. So this GBFI is, so ultimately the full ecosystem, it would be all production, but we have to start somewhere. So we're starting with kilo bars and in many ways, it's the harder one to crack. If we can get it to work for kilos, 400 ounce in theory, should be simpler, but enough work to come on the kilo bars as it is. And I'm grateful to everyone who's helping with that work. Okay, I think with that, um, we're moving to the next section of our event, um, unless there's any final questions from the floor. David, would you like to say any final words before I wrap us into champagne? Is there another one? Oh, sorry. Bearing the cost of the technology, I think that's something we have to get right, and that's part of the pilot discussion. The system doesn't work in the long term unless it's self-sustaining, and it becomes something that downstream investors, jewelry companies, and others, bullion banks, want to buy. So I think there's money that has to be spent in terms of getting off the ground and creating capacity, but long term, it has to be self-sustaining. Okay. Okay. I think with that, I'll let David say a final word. Yep, you're back on screen. Yeah, thank, okay. thank you. Um, it's, it's just worth noting that uh, Ruth and I have spent a lot of time uh, talking to all the major stakeholders around the world. And it, is become, it has become increasingly clear that the, the, the world wants this, understands the need for it, and understands principally the need that if we are able to raise the, the, the trust, provenance, and integrity game of gold, we will grow the overall pie. This industry will grow, it'll attract participation, and as a consequence, set itself in, on, a, on a fine course. Uh, we need to make ourselves more relevant uh, to the future, and uh, whether, whether that be accessibility, fungible markets, or gold bullion integrity, all things are equally important. So I want to thank everybody that Ruth and I have reached out to around the world for their participation, uh, tacit or otherwise, uh, going forward, but uh, uh, I, it would be fantastic if the world uh, buys into this and sits on one system globally at some point. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a leap forward that would be. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, David.